everyone and thanks so much for joining me. Now during this session we're going to get to grips with a model of long run economic growth which will help us to understand what has been taking place within the Chinese economy and what level of growth they can anticipate in the future. Okay let's take a look. So this is known as the Solo model pioneered by Robert Solo, famous economist and Nobel Prize winning economist. Okay, it helps to explain long-run economic growth and it has three basic sources for deriving output or the level of GDP. And they are labor, L, the capital K, and ideas, A. Now, we also need to consider the level of education of the labor force, so therefore a better educated workforce will be more productive. So we can rewrite this um, as Y GDP equals A, the ideas, education times the labor force, and K, the capital, so therefore Y equals A, E, L, K. Um, now, from this, we, we can then derive a production function. Now, I do not want to worry too much about the algebraic interpretation of all of this. If you want to go and have a look at some other videos that are online, you can do that. But I want to focus really on the fact that this is only going to be a very, very small part of your essay. Um, so therefore, I, I don't want to over, overburden you in terms of the workload here and getting to grips with all these concepts. So what we're going to consider really is, is very, very, very simple. Um, and that is that we have an axis here which represents our uh, output level for an economy, our GDP being created. And here we have the K, the physical capital that's actually being put into uh, the economy. Now, this then enables us to consider what the potential output returns would be from um, investing more and more capital and what the likely impact of that capital would be on the economic growth. OK, let's take a look at this then. Um, so firstly, if we start right down here, we can see that a very poor economy with a very, very low level of capital is going to be right down there. But as they invest into one capital good, we can see they get a really healthy return from that. Moving from one to two, again, the returns are good. Two to three, again, they enjoy a rate of return of two on each of those. Um, so their economic growth then comes out at a level of six, that's their GDP currently. But as they move from three to four, we can see uh, a certain iron logic kicks in, and that is, of course, diminishing marginal returns. Instead of getting a two output uh, increase, they're now only getting one output increase. Okay, and this is really important because we see this process of diminishing returns accelerate through due to the flattening of this potential output line. Okay, so the further along we move, the more difficult it is to actually sustain long run economic growth. Right. Let's take this up a, uh, another level here. And if we just consider the level of savings and investments that will take place within the economy, and if we consider that the savings that take place will later be invested in the economy, we can rewrite this as savings equals actual investment. Okay, now that will be a small component part of um, the actual potential output of the overall economy. So we can see that this is a fraction of the actual national output, the GDP. Okay. Now we see this, for instance, in terms of marginal propensity to save, how much is actually saved from every uh, pound, perhaps, that's actually earned. Okay. So what we can also see is that, again, this line also flattens off. So this flattens off as the level of e output increases also flattens off. So this, these are really interesting points here. But we, what we've also got to remember is that as we invest more and more in the economy, that there is going to be wear and tear. There is going to be depreciation of those capital goods. And we're going to represent this with this red line here. And this is our required investment line. Uh, so our required investment line starts off at a very, very low level. Why is that? Well, it's because the level of depreciation, the level of wear and tear, the level of maintenance needed on a very low lump, the number of roads, 
or low number of uh, capital goods it's very very small but as that capital stock increases and we move further along this axis we can see that the nature of depreciation will grow and grow until the actual level of uh, capital investments um, and capital renewal sorry will need to be far above the actual savings and actual investment but let's just consider this side over here to start with so at each of these levels we can see that there is a distance here between savings and investment and the actual required level of investment so what, what does this represent well it means that the level of investments that are being undertaken the level of savings and therefore later the level of investments will kick in and it will continually move the economy on to the next point because of course there should be incentives in, the economy, in an economy so this is a crucial point that there needs to be the right and say incentives to ensure that that capital investment uh, is undertaken but in China we're likely to of course see that those incentives are there okay um, so you continually move further and further along to this point now when we reach this point something interesting happens because moving beyond here to say for instance here and now put level there that would mean that the actual required investment is greater than uh, the actual investment that's being undertaken in, in an economy so what would happen as a result of that well what would happen is that those roads uh, they would they would just be eroded and uh, they, they would be worn down those capital goods wouldn't be repaired so tractors machinery wouldn't be repaired because there isn't sufficient required investment being undertaken so that would move us back towards this point here of convergence and this point here of convergence represents a steady state of investment okay so this is our steady state of investment now what's interesting about this is that the solo model then anticipates that economies won't continue to grow if they're just focusing on increasing this and increasing this okay and that is because labor and capital are subject to diminishing marginal returns it's also interesting to note that the level of education is also subject to diminishing returns so there's only so much education that you want people to actually uh, undertake you don't want them permanently residing in universities and not being economically productive for instance um, so these areas are, are highly subject to uh, diminishing marginal returns and if the economy fails to actually derive further ideas they will not move off this point okay so so far so good now let's then consider what we've seen here before we move on so firstly over this process we can see that the actual level of growth is really quite rapid now this is what explains how China have been able to grow really rapidly so they've been able to grow very very rapidly and that the nature of their growth that has been undertaken has been under a catch-up based growth phenomenon and this simply means that it occurs due to capital accumulation now that may well be capital goods but it's also of course exploitation of their labor as a form of physical capital here um, sorry as a, a form of human capital um, okay so this is the catch-up growth the difficult stuff starts when we get onto this cutting edge growth and this occurs due to idea accumulation now there's also something that's worth considering when it comes to China and that is the fact that China's um, China's level of savings is very very high they save a lot a lot of citizens in China do not benefit from any sort of welfare state and this does pose problems for them so therefore what's interesting here is to consider actually China's savings level might be uh, as high as that for instance okay so therefore we could see that 
China's capital accumulation could continue for um, the foreseeable future until they actually arrive at this point of convergence. Okay, so that's uh, an interesting point. But clearly, what it also illustrates is the need for economies to develop ideas which would then enable the potential output to reach higher levels, right up here, for instance. And of course, that would shift up the level of savings that can take place and the, therefore the level of investments. So through these ideas accumulation, the innovation that's needed in the Chinese economy, this would help them to move towards more cutting edge growth. And that is growth due to uh, ideas accumulation. Right, there's um, also a couple of other points that we just need to bear in mind when it comes to China. And that is that this model was very much derived under a uh, under the notion, the assumption that there's political neutrality. Now, in China, of course, there is not political neutrality. We know there is a highly interventionist government. So, therefore, what role will they play in this? Will they be more productive? Will they be less productive? It's very much debatable here, but what we certainly know is that the assumptions with which that Robert Solo derived this model, political neutrality, they allowed the market to function. Um, how will this affect the level of uh, state and, uh, sorry, the level of um, actual investment that is undertaken? It's an interesting point to consider. It also considers, of course, that these goods are homogenous in their nature, that labor and capital are homogenous. Now, to what extent is that true? Well, it's uh, another interesting one, but here we can also see why China wants to move towards this cutting edge growth and wants better, better ideas uh, and better innovation. Final thing to note is that this catch up growth also helps to explain why LEDCs can grow faster than MEDCs. This growth is really the low hanging fruit method. You're picking the low hanging fruit it's very, very simple. It's, it's easy to achieve to some degree, okay? But the cutting edge growth is where the hard work really begins. But due to the nature of China's growth, say for instance, we, we've discussed how it's sustained in double digits for many years. Here, we might just see two to 3% growth. And because of this, there can be what's known as a conditional convergence between LEDCs and MEDCs. What will then determine how much the MEDCs progress, the quality of their institutions, as well as the quality of their ideas. Okay, I hope that's all right. Do ask if you've got any questions, uh, but there it is. That's the solo model. Very, very simple, I hope. Um, okay, if you want to find out more about this, there's some excellent other videos out there. Let's so go and check those out, please. Uh, but uh, I hope I've given a nice simple interpretation of what this means for China. Thanks ever so much. Bye-bye.